21st Precinct, Sergeant Lyon. Who shot? Well, where is this? Wait a minute, don't talk so fast now. That's 1487, is that right? Yeah. In the restroom? You are in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, yeah. the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right, I'll send the officers right over there. Yeah, right away. You just wait there, show them where it is. Yeah. Just wait right there. Okay. 21st Precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of the square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st. 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants, of whom I'm the boss. My name is Cronin, Vincent P. Cronin. I am captain in command of the 21st Precinct. I was doing night duty, 4 p.m. to 8 a.m. It had been raining hard when I came on the job, and it continued to rain throughout the night. After I turned out the platoon for the 12 to 8 tour at midnight, I went on patrol of the precinct in sector car number 3. I returned to the station house at 3.30 a.m. to read and sign reports and communications. I caught up generally with the voluminous paperwork that plagues commanding officers. Because he's on the job more than 16 consecutive hours when he works night duty, it is both permitted and recommended that the precinct commander get some rest during the early hours of the morning, if conditions permit. So, shortly after 4 a.m., I went to sleep on the couch in my office with instructions to the desk officer, Lieutenant Snyder, that I be awakened in time to turn out the platoon for the day tour. Captain? Hmm? Excuse me, Captain. Huh? Yeah? I'm sorry. Oh, what is it, Sergeant? We've got a homicide. Oh? Where? 1487 Lexington, a restaurant. Mm. The pastry chef. You know, the baker. He was shot twice. The car on the way here for me? Yes, sir. I put out a call. It'll be here for you in a minute. Okay. What time is it, Sergeant? 5.25. Now, was it robbery? Could be. Is it still raining? Yes, sir. You'd better take your raincoat. Mm. The information we've got so far is that the pastry chef comes to work at midnight. Uh-huh. The restaurant closes at 1 in the morning, but the pastry chef works all night in the kitchen alone, baking. The kitchen help starts coming in a little after 5. First one to come on the job, found the baker on the floor, and place a wreck. Your car's outside, Captain. Okay. Does that sign the blotter? Now, well, here it goes. That's probably the press starting to burn in here. What detective's role, Lieutenant? Battalion Howard, Captain. Mm-hmm. Precinct, well, what about Lieutenant King? They notified him at home. He's on his way. Mm-hmm. He was around here till after 2. Probably didn't get a chance to even get the bed warm. Well, there's a sure cure for that, Captain. You can have his phone taken out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Within a few minutes, sector car number two had driven me to 1487 Lexington Avenue, the scene of the homicide. It was still raining hard when we pulled up to the place. The front of the restaurant, a large and popular place, was dark. The flashlights of police officers inside could be seen poking around the empty dining room. I instructed the operator of the car to pull around to the kitchen entrance on the cross street. Parked there were two sector cars, the patrol sergeant's car, the detective squad car, and an ambulance. I got out of my car, crossed the sidewalk to the kitchen door, where a patrolman had been posted by Sergeant Lyons to keep out unauthorized persons. The patrolman opened the door as I approached. Okay, my son. Sergeant? Oh, hello, Captain. What have we got? Want to take a look? Yeah. Now, it looks like robbery. The fellow was in here alone. Uh-huh. That's just the way he was found. You see, one shot got him in the shoulder, the other one in the forehead. Mm. His name is Eugene Francis Wilmont. According to some cards that were in his street clothes hanging on the hook over there, he resided at 2119 Mill Avenue in the Bronx. And he's 31 years old. He's the baker here, Captain. He comes to work at midnight. Mm-hmm. He's here all alone after the place closes at 1 a.m. He makes rolls and bread, pies, cakes, and so forth. He works all night until 8 a.m. You want to take a look over here, Captain? Mm, yes. The boss usually doesn't get in to open a safe till after 8 in the morning. The place opens for business at 6.30, so it's... Been the custom to leave about $100 in coins and small bills locked in this drawer right here. Mm-hmm. The early cashier has a key to the drawer. He uses the money for change until the boss gets in. Mm-hmm. He really hacked away on that drawer, didn't he? Yes, sir, he did. Apparently with that meat cleaver there. Must have taken a good 10 minutes to get it open. 
No sign of the gun around? No, sir. He must have taken it away with him. He or they? Yes, sir. He or they. Hmm. The detectives are talking to the fellow that found him right now. That fellow over there, Emilio Aguada. He's the fry cook. He's due in here a quarter after five. House floor, then. Yes, sir. Oh, you don't need all these men around here, Sergeant. Get some of them back on the job. Okay, Captain. I thought he was sick or something. Fainted. That's what I thought. All right, take the car. Oh, hello, Captain. Hello, Captain. Oh, why? Captain, this is Emilio Aguada. He found the body. He's the fry cook here. I come in, and there he was, right in the middle of the floor, dead. Blood all over. How'd you get in, Emilio? Well, just like every morning with my key. Door wasn't standing open. It was locked. I used my key. You always worked alone here at night, Emilio? Yeah, we bake all night, so we have fresh rolls, bread, cake, so forth in the morning. You see, we got a sign in the dining room. All baking done on the premises. He did it, Wilmot. Did he always work here alone? Oh, well, yeah, all alone, yeah, yeah. And you were always the first employee here in the morning? Always. I'm the fry cook. Oh. I got to get things heated up. The deep fat fryers for the breakfast rush. You know, French fries like that. Was the baker always here from the time the restaurant closed at 1 a.m. until you came to work? Yeah, yeah. We had to have rolls and bread and finish it. Did you ever see anybody with him? Or did he ever tell you he had friends then visiting during the night? Well, yeah, once in a while. Oh, once in a while what? Once in a while he had company. He didn't come in to work until midnight. Once in a while he had a date. He'd bring her in the kitchen. He'd work. He'd keep him company. Did you ever see a woman in here with him? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, once in a while. Oh, always the same woman? Yeah, he went with her. Well, do you know her name? Well, she's a married woman. She's got husbands. I don't like to make her any trouble. Well, she's got trouble whether you make it for her or not. Don't you think so, Emilio? Yeah, 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 she's got it. All right, what's her name? Edna. Edna what? Edna, I don't know. Here's Lieutenant King. Yeah. He said Edna what, but I don't remember. Hello, Captain. Mind? Go oh, ahead, Lieutenant. Uh, Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant, this is Emilio Aguada. He found the body. Lieutenant King, Emilio, is commanding officer of the 21st Detective Squad. How do you do? Mr. Aguada, what's it look like, Whitey? Oh, a drawer where about $100 was kept was broken open, Lieutenant. Robbery, maybe. But Emilio here says the victim never opened the door for anyone he didn't know. Isn't that right? Yeah, I forgot my key one morning. I had some time convincing him it was me before he'd opened the door. Well, this time it looks like he was convinced. Within a few minutes, detectives of the Manhattan East Homicide Squad arrived to aid the 21st Squad. And the investigation got underway. Detectives of the 21st Squad and the Homicide Squad were assigned to various tasks in this connection. Detectives Vitaly and Howard, for instance made a call at an apartment building on West 101st Street, an address found in the victim's wallet. Yeah, somebody's coming. Yeah. Well, it's about time you... Oh. You Mrs. Edna Hovland? Yeah, that's right. You'll have to excuse me. I thought you were somebody else. I thought you were my husband. What is it? We're detectives. All right. Where have you got him? Every time I turn around, I'm being waked up at 7 o'clock in the morning because he's in some jail. He's always getting in some kind of trouble. Uh, may we come in? Sure, come ahead. I'm used to it. Don't mind the house. I haven't had a chance to straighten up yet. That's okay. I'm Detective Howard. This is Detective Vitale. How do you do? Mrs. Holland. Well, what did he do now? He was down in Jersey, Trenton. He wrote me he'd be home last night, 10.30 at the latest. Did he show up? I ask you, did he show up? He did not. Never seen a man like him. It's a wonder I stuck with him this long. I've been wanting to leave him and wanting to leave him, but I stuck like a fool. What's he in for now? Well, we don't have your husband, Mrs. Holden. You don't? No, we don't. Well, what do you want, then? You know a man named Eugene Francis Wilmot? Sure, Gene. I know Gene. Is he in trouble? What did he do? He's never been in trouble before. He's dead. Gene? You're kidding. Well, I wish I was. Oh, no. That's awful. When did it happen? I only saw him yesterday afternoon. Sometime during the night. You mean he just died? What from? No, he didn't just die. He was shot. Shot? He was alone in the kitchen of the restaurant. Somebody came in there. Do you mind if I sit down? This is some news. No, go right ahead. You never met a sweeter guy in all your life. You never met a sweeter guy. Who did it? That's what we're trying to find out. How long have you known Jane? Oh, I don't know. 
three, four, five months, something like that. I was thinking of marrying him. You're married already, aren't you? Married? You don't call this married, do you? That husband of mine. I've been wanting to leave him for years. It's no life with him. He works out of town all the time on road construction. He's an operator of one of those big machines they use to build roads. He goes on these jobs like the one down in Trenton. Never sends me any money, hardly. And when he's in town, he's always raising some kind of fuss. Accuses me of running around with this one and with that one. No kind of life with Phil. It's no kind of life with him at all. How often did you see Dean Wilmond? Oh. Two or three times a week. I don't know. I was going to get a divorce and we were going to get married. At least we were thinking about getting married. Your husband know Jean? Phil, oh, sure, he knew Jean. He didn't like him, though. Why not? On account of me, I guess. On account of I was interested in Jean. He didn't like him at all. Where is your husband now? Look, don't ask me where he is. I don't know. The rent was due five days ago. Here I am with hardly a nickel in the house and he hasn't shown up. He got off his construction job there near Trenton last night. He was supposed to be home. I thought you were him at the door. You said your husband didn't like Jean. Did he hate him? I don't know. I guess you could say he hated him. Listen, you don't think Phil killed him, do you? What do you think? Don't ask me. I don't know. I didn't ask you what you know. I asked you what you think. Well, I wouldn't put him past him. I'll say that. That no good... Bum. I get a chance to do something decent for myself. He'd do anything to break it up. It's just like him. Poor Jean. Such a nice guy. Really a nice guy. Yeah, so we understand. I guess it always happens to nice guys, huh? I guess. It couldn't happen to a bum like that husband of mine. It's got to happen to a nice guy like me. Well, that's life for you. The investigation into the homicide continued. In addition to assigning detectives to run down what leads existed, Lieutenant King and members of the 21st Squad and Homicide Squad remained at the restaurant to question all employees as they came to work and to talk to the proprietor. I stayed there until it was time to return to the station house to turn out the platoon for the 8 to 4. When I signed the blotter... The desk officer informed me of a teletype message calling a special conference of all borough, division, and precinct commanders in the lineup room, police headquarters, 240 Center Street at 9 a.m. The conference, called by the police commissioner, lasted until 11.15. At that time, I returned to the station house in order to change into civilian clothes and, finally, go off duty. Hello, Sergeant. Captain. Oh, what's you doing? Quiet tour. Just a lot of calls from the press and that homicide, that's all. And a couple of messages for you. Nothing that looks important. I'll uh, sign the blood in. Yes, sir. No, I'll take that call, sir. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Collins. Okay. 19. All right, Sergeant. Lieutenant King, how's it going? Well, we still need a break. Well, Matt, uh, you all through up there? Yes, sir. Your message is, Captain. Oh, thanks. Well, what's it look like, Matt? Well, it looks like robbery, Captain. The money is missing out of the drawer. Uh-huh. There's another angle, too. This baker, Wilmont, was going with a married woman. Her husband was supposed to be home last night and didn't show. We want to talk to him. Is the husband that kind of a guy? Well, I don't know. Any husband can be that kind of guy. Then you think robbery's out? No, not necessarily. The money was taken. I had a long talk with the owner of the restaurant. This Wilmont was pretty cautious when he was working there alone. He wouldn't open the door unless he was sure the person had wanted in. If it was robbery, I figured it had to be someone that Wilmot knew and someone who knew where the money was kept. A former employee, maybe. Mm, that could be. The proprietor told me about a kitchen helper he fired last week. He came in drunk and nasty a couple of times. Let him go. Did uh, Wilmot know him? Yeah, he knew him. Got a couple of men out tracing the boy. His name is Julio Fernando Viesca. Moved from his address last week. The people asked that they thought he went up to Connecticut to work. Bridgeport. Then it doesn't look so good. No, sir. At the moment, I'd like to like the burnt-up husband angle a little better. Yeah. That yeah, does look a little better. I've got Howard and Vitaly over there planted, waiting for him to show up at home. Yeah. Captain Cronin? Yeah. Dr. Hustler, you think? 
Yes, 88 is calling in for you. All right, I'll take my office. Yes, I'm interested to know how it comes out, Matt. That's yes, all right, Captain. Well, I've got to get up there. Twenty-first precinct, Captain Cronin. Ah, yes, Dr. Hutchford. Oh? Uh-huh. Well, uh, well, I was supposed to go off duty at 8 this morning, but, no, we had a homicide break. Mm-hmm, see. Yeah. Well, uh, oh, I'll be back on the job 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. Will it keep to Lent? Uh-huh. All right, Doctor. Sure. Sure, I'll stay around and meet you here. Well, look, could you, could you make it before one thing? Oh. All right. All right, goodbye, Dr. Hussberg. I had two hours to wait before the visit from Dr. Hussberg, the principal of Public School 88, on what he described as an urgent matter. So I began to read and sign reports and communications from this and the previous to it. In the meantime, Detectives Vitali and Howard maintained their plants at the apartment of Mr. and Mrs. Philip Hovland, waiting for him to return. Detective Howard watched out the front window down onto the sidewalk as Vitali sat on a studio couch. The woman of the house, Mrs. Edna Hovland, was in the kitchen. What do you see down there, Whitey? Nothing. You know what? What? When I went to the candy store to ring into Lieutenant King, you know. I called my wife. Oh, yeah? I told her I got stuck. We had a homicide and I wouldn't be home. What'd she say? Well, she said bring home the evening paper so she could read about it. Uh, I said, honey, I'll tell you all about it. No, she wants to read it in the paper. You mean some spot of the papers don't carry, huh? <laughs> you telling me. I'm supposed to be off the job at 8 o'clock in the morning. Where does she think I'm going to go at 8 o'clock in the morning? Beats me. Yeah. Well, I don't know where he is. You see what I told you about his being unreliable? You can't depend on him. Yeah, we see. You know, it's getting around lunchtime. It is? Yeah, all I got in the kitchen I can whip up is a can of soup and some saltines. Oh, well, we're not hungry, Mrs. Hovland. Well, I'm getting hungry. You don't mind if I fix them for myself? No, no. Go right ahead. Man with a suitcase getting out of a cab. Oh, wait. Is that your husband, Mrs. Hoblin? Yeah, that's him. That's Phil. All right, let's get away from the window. Imagine, I got a can of soup and a few saltines in the house, and he takes taxi cabs. You see what I mean? Uh, Mrs. Hoblin, uh, my partner and I want to wait in the kitchen. You answer the door, all right? Yeah, all right, but I don't get the production. Well, I want you to break the news to him about Gene. About Gene being dead, you mean? That's the idea, but don't tell him that we're here. I shouldn't. No, he'll know soon enough. All right? It's all right with me. What do I care? I guess that's him. All right, you go ahead. Hey, no, don't close it. That's good. Okay. All right! Hi. Well, look what the wind blew in. That all you got to say to me? Look what the wind blew in? I got plenty more to say to you. What? What? As if you didn't know. Well, tell me. Sure, I'm just itching to, as if you didn't know already. Jane Wilmont got killed. No kidding. No kidding. Who killed him? Well, a couple of cops were here and told me about it. They got a sneaky suspicion you did. Well, they're out of their minds. I was in Trenton. I just got off the train. Oh, I'll bet. Look, if I was going to kill somebody, you don't think I'd kill somebody over you, do you? You told him to stay away from me. You told him to stay away from me or you'd kill him. You forget you ever heard that. I'll forget nothing. You didn't say anything to the cops about it. What if I did? If you did, I'll break every bone in your body. I swear I'll break every bone in your body. The fine husband I got. He don't come home when he's supposed to. If he does, he brings me nothing but a load of dirty laundry. And now he's going to break every bone in my You're body. You're asking for it, Edna. You're asking for it right between the eyes. Yeah, well, why don't you go ahead, wise guy? I don't need much encouragement, I'll tell you that. All right. Who are you? We're police officers. You just stay right where you are. Wait a minute, listen. What's the idea? You'll find out what the idea is. Okay, why do you take a look in that bag? Yeah. All right, you hold still. What are you looking for? I got nothing. If you think I had something to do with that baker getting killed, you're out of your mind. 
I got off the job in Trenton last night. I took the train this morning. I just got here 15, 20 minutes ago. That's where I was. Isn't that right, Edna, Trenton? That's where you said you were. You and Wilmot didn't get along so well, hmm? Listen, I was out of town breaking my back on a job. He was chasing after my wife. Would you get along with a guy like that? He wasn't chasing after me. I was chasing after him. You stay out of this. I think you'd better stay out of it, Mrs. Hovland. Just sit down right there, hmm? He's a liar, a born liar. Nothing in the bag, Even now. if he wanted to tell the truth, he wouldn't know how. What are you trying to do to me? You'd just better sit down there, Mrs. Hovland, and listen. What did you do in Trenton? I wasn't exactly in Trenton. It was outside of Trenton on a road job. I ran a bulldozer. Well, for who? For the state of New Jersey on a road job. And you got finished up last night? That's right. Last night I got finished up and paid off. Where'd you spend the night? Down there in Trenton, this rooming house where I stayed. Mm -hmm. You stayed there last night and took the train this morning. Is that right? I told you it was right. Have you ever been arrested before, Phil? What do you mean, before? Am I arrested now? For what? Were you ever arrested? Well, yeah, I was arrested. He was arrested and big. Keep your mouth shut. You ever do any big time? Yeah, I did some big time. Where? Sing Sing. For what? Polonius assault. I got in a fight with a guy. What'd you get out of it? I did 22 months. Uh, you must have come close to killing him. It was touch and go. Yeah, well, Phil, this time it looks like you made it. Here's your hat. Let's go. It was a quarter of two when I finished with Dr. Husberg, the principal of PS88. As soon as I left my office, I went upstairs to the 21st Detective Squad. The suspect in the homicide case, Phil Hovland, was sitting next to a desk where Detective Howard was taking his pedigree. Detective Vitale was on the telephone on the other side of the room. Yeah. What year was that? 1945. Excuse me, Whitey. Yes, sir. Uh, Lieutenant King in his office? Oh, yes, sir. Thanks. Uh, it was an honorable discharge. Yes, it was an honorable discharge. What made you think it wasn't? Yes. Captain Cronin. Come in, Captain. Yeah. Come on. Captain. I, uh... I know you're up to your neck, Matt. Uh, sorry to bother you. That's all right. Look, uh, this Dr. Husberg, principal of PS88, was just in here. He's got three boys over there. Been flashing a lot of money around the school today and yesterday. He says he thinks there's only one way they could have got hold of it, Matt. Yes, sir. Yeah, they're pretty bad actors, he says. Thinks we ought to take a look into it. I asked him to come up here with me, but, you know, he had to get back. I told him you'd send a man around to talk to him, okay? Yeah, sure, Captain. Good. I'll send someone over there this afternoon. Yes. Come in, Vate. Uh, Trenton just called back with me. Yeah? Hello, Captain. Vate. Right. They checked out that road project and the rooming house bull. Uh-huh. Phil didn't stay at the rooming house last night, and he was fired off the road job on Monday. He didn't work yesterday like he said he did. Well, looks like that wraps it up, huh? Yes, sir. Tell Whitey to bring him in here again. Yes, sir. Oh, Whitey. Yeah? The lieutenant wants him in here. Okay. He was at the rooming house the night before last, they said, but not last night. I've got a pretty good idea where he was last night. So have I, Captain. All right. Go on in, Phil. Come on over here and sit down. Where? Right there. Shut the door, Whitey. Yes, sir. All right, Phil. What do you say we stop wasting time? I'm willing. By your own admission, you didn't like Wilmont. He was running after your wife. If he asked me, I would have given it to him. You killed him, and you know it. I was in Trenton. You were, huh? Well, let's get this straight. You worked until yesterday afternoon. You slept in that rooming house last night. You took a train from Trenton this morning, went right from Penn Station to your flat. That's what I told you. You've been telling us nothing but lies. You were in New York. You went to that restaurant, knocked on the door. Wilmot knew you and let you in. When you got in there, you shot him. You broke open that drawer to make it look That's good. That's not so. I've got that, Lieutenant. I was in Trenton. That's where I was. 21st Squad, Detective Battalion. Oh, yes. A bender on the straight line for you, Lieutenant. All right, thanks. 21st Squad, Lieutenant King. Yes, Bender. Yeah. Oh, he did, huh? All right. Yeah, you coming in with him? Okay, good. Why are you lying to us, Phil? I'm not lying, and I didn't kill him. I know you didn't kill him. That was one of my detectives on the phone. I got the man who did. Who was it, Matt? The kitchen worker? Yes, sir. They found him in a flat on 124th Street. He had the gun there and the money he took. He made an admission. Well, how do you like that? I told you I didn't do it. How many times do I have to tell you? Why did you have to lie about where you were? This is no spot to lie if you want to get straightened out. If you were in New York, you should have said so. I wasn't in New York. I was in Trenton. In jail. Oh? 
Yeah, I got a little drunk the day before yesterday afternoon. I got in a fight with a guy. I wound up in a can. I, I didn't want to say anything about it because I still owe a little short time from that bit I did. Getting in jail down there could have got my parole revoked. You're not going to say anything about it, are you? Well, if I do, you'll hear about it from your parole officer. Can I go? Yeah, go ahead. Hello, so long. I'll see you. Leave it open. Yeah. Uh, Captain, did you ever see anything that looked so good, blow so high, so fast? No, but one killer's as good as another, isn't he? Yes, sir. Well, do you want me for anything else, Lieutenant? I'm carrying a pocket full of squeals. Yeah, V, take a ride over to PS-88 and talk to the principal. He's got three boys he's kind of worried about. Yes, sir. Right away. Come on, Captain. V? <laughs> Kitchen worker. I had it pegged the other way. I had it pegged on the husband for sure. You did? Yes, sir. Well, that's what I got for trying to share Shayla with them. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Collins. What do you mean he's missing? Missing from where? And so it goes. Around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh-and-blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct. A factual account of the way the police work in the world's larger city is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the Police Department, City of New York. James Gregory in the role of Captain Cronin, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King. Featured in tonight's cast were Jack Orison, Louis Van Ruten, Wendell Holmes, Joan Loring, John Sylvester, John Larkin, and Bill Lipton. 21st Precinct is written and produced by Stanley Niff. Art Hannah speaking.